film. Um, we're okay on the mic, yeah. Um, really, really stunningly beautiful. Um, want to congratulate you, Mark and, and John. Before we get to talk about filmmaking, about which I know very little, and I will expect you to tell us all about it, uh, just from the point of view of um, the architectural profession and the culture of architecture, I want to thank you for something really important that you've done. Um, there were two great Irish 20th century architects, Eileen Gray and Kevin Roach. And both of them were forgotten, not only in their home country, but more or less worldwide for more than a quarter of a century. Eileen Gray was rescued in the late 1960s by Joseph Rickford. And I think your film, <coughs> Mark and John, may rescue Kevin and bring him back to the world again, um, while he's still with us to enjoy that. So that's an enormous, enormous cultural contribution that you've made to Ireland and to architecture. Thank you. Um, before we get into the q and I just really need to thank some people. I um, really want to thank the IFI, Cineva, Flynn, and all the programming team here for having us. Um, it's like the perfect place to debut this film. We really want to thank the Irish Film Board also, who supported us in the development and production of this film, as well as the Four Foundation and Just Films in New York, who helped us every step of the way. Um, also my producers, John and Nikki Gogan. Um, and then, of course, our wonderful cinematographer, Kate McCullough, who has two other movies here, um, and, of course, is filming and sees somewhere at the moment, so can't see any of her movies. But you can saw some of her visuals there. She's well, the best DP in Ireland. Um, well, I, I, I would like you to talk, if you've done the thanks, I would like you to talk about how and, you... And my parents, my parents. <laughs> every filmmaker should thank their parents, because yeah, that's the number one reason why we were filmmakers, because your parents, you know, let you go make films. <laughs> when you should be getting a real job, so one thing my parents and my sister who's here as well. Okay. Well, like, like architecture, of course, uh, filmmaking is a collaborative process. Uh, there may be a name or two that are stuck out front, but um, you, I, I, I want to talk about uh, the team you put together. In particular, I want to talk about Kate McCullough and the cinematography, which is extraordinary with this what I, in my uh, innocence, uh, described to my daughter who studied film as this sort of pinhole focus that appears in the film quite regularly, and then I was told that there's actually a proper term for that, which you will tell me um, about. But I'd like, I'd like to talk about the you to talk about the dynamic of working with Kate, uh, how those decisions about framing and filming and focusing and super eights and all of those sort of things were done. And similarly, with the extraordinarily exquisite score by David Garrity, which is one of the best I've ever heard in a film. I mean, it just blows me away. This film will be entirely different if somebody else had scored it. So please, would you talk about how you selected that team and how you work together? Yeah, um, Kate is she's one of the busiest cinematographers in Ireland today, um, but she's also one of the smartest and crucially um, most fun people, so working with Kate doesn't feel like work, it's always cl very collaborative but very fun, so we basically talked a lot about, because we didn't have a chance to recce the, the building, so we're literally just uh, looking at photographs and then trying to work out how we can film them so that people feel like they've been there in some way, and of course some of them we couldn't get access to, so some of them are, we're, we have to stay outside. But myself and Kate really, really talked a lot about asking our producer, could we get some helicopters mm -hmm. like, <laughs> in New York, which is like super cheap, as you can imagine. <laughs> so lots of helicopters in New York, and then lots of moving the camera. So um, strapping our assistant camera to into a wheelchair and... Um, We're doing that in the, yeah, in the Wall yeah, Street. Uh, the Wall Street lobby, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so pushing, pushing a guy in a wheelchair um, around a lot of Kevin's buildings. Um, which, you know, it's the low budget way of getting some movement and getting a feeling of passing through his buildings. Because his buildings, if you've been to any of his buildings or maybe you can see them, there's, I guess you don't get a sense of them until you move through them. They're so sprawling, they're so big. Um, but as you move through them, you really get a sense of them. So they were the two things. And then also... And, and lighting. Lighting. And lighting, you know, like his buildings are all, I suppose he really thinks about how the person's going to enjoy natural light in them. 
So as you can, as you hear in the film, he talks a lot about the office worker and making their lives better. So it's always about trying to put them close to nature, put them close to natural light, and then you know we never have to use actually any artificial light because these buildings are so they're so well lit anyway. They're like movie sets. Um, so and then a lot of tilt shift so that we can really focus the eye. And the tilt shift is where you can. Um, play with focus in a planar first, so you, you're not actually, you know, relying on depth of field, but you can actually focus the eye very um, clearly on the diagonals, on the, the rectangulars, um, and frame his buildings in, in an even, in a different way, not just straightening the, straightening the lines. So they were the kind of things we talked about, and also making sure it was sunny, you know, <laughs> we only filmed but, during but sunshine, how, which is very how, how do you How do you do that? Because you've got flights booked, I know the day that you shot with me, you know, it was it was that day or it was no day, and it was that evening those hours, unfortunately, the sun was, was glinting into the room, but it could have been very different. Yeah. What, what were your backups? Yeah. Well, uh, well, yeah, you have to try to maximize your chances. I mean, obviously, we were, um, and, uh, an absolute re requisite was you had to go and, and, and pick days in summer. But say if it rained in the morning, you, you'd have, you'd still have the rest of the day in a long evening to play with. And you know, going in winter when you just couldn't take that risk. So, yeah, and um, yeah, yeah, you try, you, yeah, you try to build in a little bit of slack into the in, yeah into the schedule. So, so did you shoot over two summers? Yeah, or three? Um, well, yeah, the first shoot was uh, was uh, was the pro was a promo. And actually, all the shoots appeared. The first one was in July two thousand and fourteen, and then they actually got some funding. We back in November two thousand and fifteen. All the mostly to shoot interviews went back to the states. But then we discovered we had a bizarre few couple of days of really warm and um, bright, clear skies. And so we, we took quite a lot of shots then in November, uh, unexpectedly. And um, yeah, and, and then, yeah, yeah, so the, so it was, yeah, the last shoot was, I think it was July in the States, August in, August in, 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 in no, actually, yeah, August in, um, France, in, in France and Spain, and then back to the States in September. Oh, and then the, cent the convention center was actually in July in Ireland, and actually that was a very nerve-wracking one because we turned up and, oh, it's really windy. Will the drone fly? Will it get puffed about? But, but it seemed to, seemed to withstand the breeze pretty well. And, uh, and actually the clouds kind of looked pretty okay. So can we come back to David Garrity? Mm. Can you tell me <laughs> about David choosing him? Why? Yeah. I mean, it's... It, am I am I right that it's as extraordinary as I think it is? Yeah, no, well, I worked with Dave on all my films. David Gardy is a guitarist and songwriter with Bell X One, who lots of people will know. Um, very, very, an, an amazing Irish band. But he's recently got into doing movie scores. So he did my first movie, You're Ugly Two. Then we did a short film, and then this is our third time working together. Um, so again, it was a case of Dave loved the footage. And we kind of just talked about giving each section of the film a different mood. So you have you know, right rag time when you go to Columbus. Rag time yeah, in Columbus. Yeah, yeah, yeah you've got, yeah, you've got a kind of a bond fatty when you're at Bourg. Yeah, this is the most fun. Yeah, yeah, because some of these buildings look like you know they came from an, ins an insane person. Like they're like that. You know, some of the corporate he headquarters are just like bizarre. You know, there's they do look. They're bizarre. Yeah, bozar, yeah, yeah. Bozar, <laughs> bozar. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there is this kind of dread, you know, there is this like, they look like someone evil lives there. So there was this playful, you know, using symbols and drums and um, and Dave loves, of course, like experimenting with, you know, with music. So Dave really gave it an incredible um, flavor. So I mean, I listen to the music just in my apartment because I really, you know, I really like it. It's something, you know, music and architecture does kind of work on the big screen. So we talked a lot about trying to keep, you know, the interviews. We have a lot of interviews, but we're trying to, I guess, keep them to the minimum and try to have those montages of just this insane, you know, 1980s corporate architecture or 60s and 70s brutalist concrete and then let Dave Garrity, you know, have this very, the music swells and goes down yeah. and it's very orchestral and it's very playful sometimes and um, to make it fun, I guess. So whose idea was it to make the film and who made the pitch to Kevin and what was his response? Because clearly, clearly, I mean, he was a cooperative uh, uh, subject in the end, but, but how did you go, whose idea was it? And how, what was that initial yeah. talk like? Yeah, well, it was, well, it was my idea. Yeah, um, yeah it basically came, it came about from reading an article in the Irish Times uh, at the time of, of uh, Kevin's 19th birthday. And I'd worked as a distributor and sales agent for a long time, and I'd just worked on, uh, on a documentary on Oscar Niemeyer. 
uh, who had lived to um, and he, he would live to 104 years yeah, and yeah. 10 months yeah, and yeah. never stopped working and was asking for updates on his on, on projects on his deathbed and um, I read this story and thought, okay, um, the documentaries about architects are few and far between. I'd actually, I hadn't actually heard of Kevin Roach, and I'd met Mark a couple of years earlier at the Berlinale and, um, and got talking. I'd heard he's graduating architecture from UCD, but had become a filmmaker. So I thought, mm, this would be an idea. So mm -hmm. I contacted Mark and we took it from there. And uh, yeah, 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 we, yeah, yeah, we emailed Kevin, and uh, actually, uh, uh, the first time, first time, the first time I met him, he had time to talk, so I ended up chatting with Jane for, oh. yeah, for, yeah, yeah, for an hour. And uh, but and you know, after, after that, was, that was that wasn't a waste of time. No, 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 no. no. Jane, uh, but, Jane's the real power. Absolutely, you can yeah. kind of sense it, and like she almost, we would have interviewed her more, but she like refused to be interviewed at first, so I had to spend like almost an hour. Telling her how important it was just to get those get her on screen just those few seconds in yeah. New York yeah the whole, whole yeah the whole story yeah. Yeah yeah, yeah 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 so, yeah. so that our conversation so was I mean you got some extraordinary people um, for those who are not experts in the architecture field to have the likes of César Pelli um, former dean of the School of Architecture at Yale Bob Stern mm -hmm. New York's biggest shaker and mover um, and until recently the dean at Yale. Uh, and Richard Meyer, the designer of the Getty Museum outside Los Angeles, to get those to contribute was extraordinary. And to get Richard Meyer, who I've never seen an image of except in a suit and tie, to get him to turn up in a navy uh, gansey with an iron pattern on it was extraordinary. Um, how did you get them? And, and, and I would love to have heard more from Richard Meyer because he really had some important things to say. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We found we found there's a lot of goodwill towards Kevin um, uh, as we went about, and um, everybody, uh, yeah, everybody went. Oh, we're doing a documentary on Kevin Roach, and you know, would you be interested? And they all said yes. We love Kevin, and um, yeah, there was just so much. Everybody wanted to talk about him. Everybody was very, very supportive. Um, there wasn't there wasn't any kind of clashing egos or any kind of um, rivalry or anything like that. Everybody, yeah, and yeah, for, yeah. For example, and also Barbara Lee, Barbara Lee, yeah, yeah. Damonstein. And yeah, we we emailed her asking, oh, can we use her footage? And said for Kevin, anything. And that was that was kind of that we we came we came we came across the, the, the entire time. There wasn't a single person that had a bad word for Kevin. Or did you did you try talking to the former director of the Met, who was Kevin's client for thirty five forty years? Um, no, uh, no, yeah, no, we, yeah, we, we, uh, yeah, we never got as far as him. Yeah, although, yeah. although 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 there there is a new director who yeah. has who has actually ditched Kevin and yeah, brought David Chipperfield. But, yeah, 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 but then that but then that project has fallen. He's dead too. He's dead. So I think it's Kevin's work is will, will, will remain the defining work for. Okay, before we, before we throw it out to the floor, uh, we will have two microphones, by the way, so there's a roving mic uh, on either side. If you would like to ask a question, just put up your hand, please, and wait till the microphone arrives to you. You don't have to give your name, but just if you would wait for the microphone, that would be great. But uh, I found the film very funny. You know, it has a real humor to it, both in the captions and it's there in, in, in Kevin, I mean, almost at the end of every segment that he does with you. He has a smile on his face, you know, and, and, and Bob Stern kind of talks about that uh, leprechaun ego uh, and its power. Um, so I guess you could have written, I'm uh, going to have two questions for you here, Mark and, and John. I guess you could have written the film in, in four or five different ways. This is, this is one script which you wrote, but it could have taken, I know from, from Kevin's work and from other stuff that I know you filmed that you have in the can but didn't, didn't make the, the cut. You could have framed this in many different ways. So what, what was the main driver in how you framed the story? And secondly, why did you choose to give it such an Irish voice? And in that context, I'm talking about the likes of uh, Dr. Alan Rowley and myself, when you could have used, for example, Abel Lisa Pelkinen from Yale University, who wrote the book and did the big exhibition on Kevin uh, back five, six years ago, and the likes of Alexander Langer, in New York, who has been a campaigner for Kevin's interiors, particularly, for example, at the uh, UN Plaza Hotel, uh, which would have given it an American flavor that might have flown better in the States. I don't know. I mean, I guess those were big, big talking points between you and planning this. Yeah, um, I guess when you're making, I mean, this is my first documentary, so I'm certainly no expert, but the, you know, the initial planning and writing, it is vague to a certain extent, so you're trying to, you know, sculpt it as you get the footage in. So at the beginning, you know, after our first interview with Kevin, it became very clear, this guy is quite funny, quite modest. 
you know, quite crabby when he wants to be, you yeah. know, in kind of a lovable uncle or grandpa kind of way. Um, and like really still retained his Irish sense of humour, you know, despite, you know, moving to the States when he was 20, 25, 26. So that, you know, and I, in my work as well, I always try to filter through enough, you know, humour, you know, humour is so present in our everyday interactions that a movie or documentary or TV program without humour is quite alien to how I view the world. So um, a big thing was to try and get Kevin's personality into the film. So like that became a very organic thing as well as his buildings, his personality. I think you really get to feel it. And also the, you know, the architectural quotations, I think architects are viewed sometimes as quite dry, maybe and very suspiciously by members of the public. So, you know, some of these quotes, like the Frank Gehry one Frank about Gary the 98%, yeah yeah, 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 I mean... <laughs> but the timing, the pause at the end is brilliant, you know? Yeah, and the timing, I mean, that's, I think, that's, I guess... That's comedy, yeah. That's kind of, that's comic timing a little bit, yeah, yeah, that's something you kind of, um, you learn from just watching lots of movies, and... So the Irish angle versus uh, the Irish something that might have, might have um, been easier, maybe, to, to fly in America in... I don't know. I don't know if the Irish thing does work in America. Maybe, budget. maybe it is. Budget. You are cheaper than Eva and Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> we have to fly over to Connecticut to interview her. We can just interview the government. <laughs> I like it. I like it. That's a great yeah, idea. Slow budget filmmaking. <laughs> yeah, 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 we did actually have Thank a, you very much. I feel honored. Yeah, yeah, we did actually have a couple of interview slots set up with Eva and Lisa, but the first time she, she was ill and the second time, I can't remember now, but she dropped up for some reason. But... Um, but actually, we weren't, we, weren't, we weren't hung up on that he has to be a certain kind of nationality with an Irish voice flying the States and so on. And I think, and, you know, I think basically authoritative opinions such as yours and Ellen's are, will work anywhere. Yeah, and you're, you're having a pitch in New York later next month, isn't that yeah, right? Yeah, 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 we're screening at the Architecture and Design Film Festival in, of New York in, uh, on the 4th of November in Fantastic. Manhattan. Oh, and Kevin, will be, the, well, Kevin will be there. Kevin will be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Health permitting. Uh, health that. permitting, <laughs> along with some of the American voices you see in the film. Yeah. Great. Oh, Bob Stern should be great, and if Richard Murray turns up, you're made. Okay. Um, any questions from anybody? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm here in the front row. I'm sorry the light is catching me in the eye. Hold one minute, please. <laughs> uh, great movie. I'm a great film. Um, this question is probably for three of you, I think, because you mentioned um, Kevin's name was um, threatened to be lost if it wasn't for um, the, this documentary. And I wonder, you know, when we admire people's work in sport and writing and painting and that, we remember their names, they're all high profile names, but it's not the same in architecture. I pass Kevin's building every morning on the way to work and I see so many people take photographs outside it. It's like a landmark in Dublin, but if you asked any of them to remember, or did, do they know his name or the man who built it, they wouldn't be able to. And I wonder why do you think that is? Um, it's kind of a question. I think that general public or people don't consider, you know, architecture as an art. Maybe a lot of the time, you know, they don't consider architects as artists in the way that someone who composes a song or paints, you know, a picture. So I think that you know Kevin talks about it as an art here, but I don't hear many other people, you know, I guess in other disciplines talking about it as an art, so that's maybe wouldn't be my take on it, that it doesn't really have the credit that it deserves, maybe. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I think Kevin Kenny came slightly before the era of the cult of celebrity, and I mean, nowadays, you see, we asked, uh, when, when the crew asked him about it, if he considered himself, considered himself to be a star architect, and he had no time for any of that, and he's never had a marketing guru or a PR department, whereas now, the present architects, Norman Foster, the late Zaha Hadid, and so on, they all have PR departments. They're all very PR conscious and very publicity um, conscious. And I think and I think maybe that's a change. He was before that generation. He was before that. And it, it just never mattered to him as well. I think John's point is very on the point. Um, I remember when Kevin won the Brisker Prize in 1982, I was involved with the Architectural Association of Ireland and Tony Reddy in um, making at that time in 1983 a retrospective exhibition of Kevin's work uh, which was opened by Tisha Charlie Hawley in the Douglas Hyde Gallery in Trinity at the time. And so I got that was when I first got to know Kevin and, and uh, speaking with him at the time he told me that the office had only um, issued, uh, I think it was, yes, I think he said three press releases in its uh, 21 year history at that stage. One was to say that Iris Harna had died, 
One was five years later to announce that uh, Erosarnan's will had said that he could only trade under the name of Erosarnan and Associates for five years and would then have to set up his own business. So the practice was now going to be called Kevin Roach, John Dinklow and Associates. And one in 1982 when they won the Fisker Prize. So he was averse to media and all of, all of that. But I think it goes deeper. I think that, that might explain the popular or the public perception. But there is a professional um, uh, perception that has been, I think, less than generous to Kevin in Ireland, largely because he has been seen as a corporate architect. Um, and I think that's, uh, you'll see, have seen from the documentary, I think that's a superficial reading of what a corporate architect might be. He went way deeper than, than any corporate architect in Ireland has ever done, or in fact, any of his contemporaries uh, in Western architecture did at the time. That hasn't been acknowledged. And for example, to my mind, it's extraordinary that he has never been considered a candidate for Islana. You know, it's a cultural practitioner in any other field of the arts in Ireland at 95 years of age, with a global reputation, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize, which the Pritzker was uh, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, uh, that they would still be left out in the cold by the artistic establishment would be implausible. Any other questions? Uh, I just was wondering, um, it's very striking visually, you mentioned the start, I was wondering if yourself, Mark and Kate McCullough, had any ground rules in going about photographing all the different buildings, either by differentiating them or you said you were looking at them in photographs. Uh, did you have any ground rules going in, um, in, in approaching that? And not so much ground rules, but we did, because we were using such wide angle lenses to film some of his buildings, we took that into how we filmed the interviews. So a lot of the interviews, the majority of them anyway, are filmed in very unconventional uh, ways. We use like an 11 or 14 millimeter extreme wide angle lens so that you see, you know, the room, you see more of the person. If the, if the person moves their hand in the foreground, it appears like they've got a giant hand. It just gives, a, I guess, a different impression of scale that we were playing with um, when we filmed his buildings as well by using the tilt shift lenses. So you can see as well some of the buildings, we've made them look like models. So you can use the tilt shift uh, lens o to make Oakland them. Oakland in particular. Oakland, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a little like toys, you know, because he, he talks about like how he, some of the buildings actually, you know, came from watching his kids play with toys. Um, so I guess we try to, I guess, incorporate as many of, be playful, I guess, was the other thing as well. Like his buildings and how he describes them are so playful that we were like, let's you know, be playful and imaginative. There was no set ground rules, it was really just um, as be as playful as possible and really try to put you in the building as much as possible. Um, so I wouldn't say ground rules, but just, you know, basically when you're working with Kate McCullough, you, you, you listen to what she suggests and then you kind of nod politely and go, God, Kate, you're great. <laughs> I can just I can just think about like you know talking to Dave Gerdy about the music and the editing with Jordan and stuff yeah because Kate's really she's so superb and she's like you know the, the prime visual I suppose force you know behind this behind the visuals here and like most of our movies to be honest and the Super Eight did you and the Super Eight yeah that was again I think I can't remember it was either Kate's idea or. I don't know, John, if that was your idea, but it was no, it wasn't Kate. Idea. Kate loves. Kate grew up, you know, filming on film, so that was, um, and she has a Super 8 camera. So an, a budget thing again was we don't have to rent another camera. We can use Kate's Super 8 um, camera, but the Super 8 also kind of puts you, puts you in the kind of 60s or 70s yeah, yeah. in a way that home, home movie, home movie. Really, yeah, it's really home movie, um, and it's also got like a wonderful texture. You know, you see the grain, you see, you cannot hear the film going through the camera. Um, and it's, yeah, if you can ever use real film, it's it's kind of it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful. Well, I was going to close, but we've got a question, so go yeah. for it. Do you look just microphone? It's in the front row here, please. Uh, do you know that Kevin ever designed his own house that he lives in, and um, what what kind of space does he live in now? Um, I, th I think he, he did design his own house, did he? I can't remember. Well, he, 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 he doesn't do domestic architecture as a rule because he doesn't want to get involved in the fight that happens 
between a man and a wife. So he's done it before, but he stopped doing it very early because the couple can never agree and he feels responsible for a few divorces. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, so very early on he was like, no more domestic architecture. It's too fraught with personality clashes and you know, I guess if you're, if you're being asked to design corporate campuses you know, for hundreds of millions of dollars, he quickly, yeah, yeah, he quickly grew out of the domestic architecture, I think. And he didn't design his own office either. You see it in the opening of the film. It was um, a German cigar baron's um, um, uh, big pavilion, big house. And so that's the office in, in Camden, Connecticut. Um, but I think in terms of domestic architecture, one of the important things the film does um, is that it states explicitly and it has Cesar Pelli, who is uh, irreproachable and who was in the office at the time, saying it on record that Kevin was the chief designer of the Irwin Miller House. Um, that has normally always been attributed solely to Eros Sarna, but, but <coughs> we would have known that Kevin was, was the assistant in charge, but by saying that, it's really important. The exteriors are shown a lot. There's one glimpse in, in through the window that shows uh, the, the sunk conversation bit. And any fans of Sam Stevenson's in Dublin will know that Sam Stevenson was an enormous fan of Kevin Roach. And the conversation pit in number 31, his famous house, was modeled in a miniature version on that conversation pit in the, in the Irwin Miller house. I might also say that Irwin, the Irwin Miller contribution to the uh, Athens of the, of, the, of the Prairie was extraordinary because uh, uh, Miller's view was uh, that the Cummins Company uh, could do a lot for, for that town. And he spoke to the entire business community. And he said to them that if any of them were building a building, um, he would pay the architect's fees. They would only have to pay the construction cost of their buildings, provided they built downtown, and provided they used an architect over this tea with supply. So that's a kind of a unique uh, moment in, in uh, architectural patronage mid-century uh, anywhere in the world, too. Is that it? But there's one last question, I think, in the middle there. The, the lady with the blonde hair and glasses. And Duncan Stewart as well. So there's two, one, the lady behind, and then come forward to, to Duncan, please. Well, thank you. Um, I'm when he was asked about um, dealing with difficult times, I think I heard him say that he, he should have been a poet and he wouldn't have had to deal with um, difficult times in that sense. I just wondered, in what way do you think he was a bit of a poet in cutting through the essence of things and really being true to people and that sort of thing? I think you get a sense of it when he talks you know, I would call him more like a philosopher than a poet because um, his way of looking at people and buildings, he talks about, you know, the Ford Foundation, you know, Sigmund Freud says that we do need to be in touch with nature. It's one of humans' most primal instincts. Um, and also the need to form part of a community, um, which I think comes from him, you know, from his upbringing in Mitchellstown. I think he would have felt very differently if he grew up in Little Italy in Manhattan in the 1920s as opposed to Mitchellstown. So I think that philosophy of putting the user first and making sure that every office worker is in touch with nature but also has an opportunity to interact with each other um, was like his core belief. Um, and you can see it in almost every single one of his buildings. So I think when he says, when he talks about him being a poet, that's what I read from it. Um, but I mean, he, he did tell me the story about when he came to New York and at the age of 25 or 26, you know, all he had in his, in his possession, you know, was some clothes and he had like 15 books of poetry. That was kind of it. And he, you know, left the poetry behind and decided to kind of like, I guess, practice poetry in, in his architecture. Um, so I don't know if he's ever actually written any poems because I never got that sense from him, but I think he's like left us something uh, even you know, more valuable, maybe. Uh, two rows forward here, if we can pass the mic. Thank down. you. Thank you for Thank you. wonderful documentary for bringing it to us. I, you know, I'm so pleased. And so pleased to see how you treat it. Thanks. Um, in, in the respectful way you treat it. And, you know, showing the, the good side of the character. When I was 18 or 19, I wrote to Kevin. In, 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 I think it was New Haven, his practice, somewhere in Connecticut. And, and I wrote a nice letter to him, looking for a job for the summer. He wrote back a 
room and lent her to me and offered me a job. I remember it was not the amount of money I won, because I was a student and I was going to go to the stage to make some money. <laughs> anyway, Skidmore's and Merritt offered me a lot more money for the summer. So I went to Skidmore's Merritt. I later met Karen in Dublin. I can't remember, was it in the 80s? But it was a time when energy was massively important to me in terms of our buildings and our cities. And I remember having a long conversation with him about this subject and talked through, and I know he was very much close to nature, his buildings and his landscape, the Ford Foundation, he was short all of that. But did he ever, when we were talking to him, bring out any of those issues? Because he was very focused on the future. But did you ever see anything of that in his architecture, where he was looking to designing for climate change, or for very, very low energy buildings, or low materials, in terms of all of that. Did any of that ecological side of his architecture emerge at all? It came out, I guess, um, like not, you know, I don't think it was ever the number one driving force for him, just because I guess it was never maybe the number one driving force for any of his clients. So I think like somewhere like something like the Ford Foundation, you know, which reutilized rainwater, you know, collected rainwater in the gutters to help water the plants and stuff. You know, that was very forward thinking at the time, you know, in 1968 in New York. Um, and then I know like the convention center is, you know, he's very proud of the energy, you know, the energy efficiency, ra energy efficiency rating of, of that particular building. That was a primary concern of the client. Um, but I think I suppose like his his main philosophical you know belief was about getting nature into the building. Um, so I guess in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, when you're designing for corporate American architecture, I think what he did was try to respect the environment. So as he says, like try not to cut down, you know, try to save as many trees as possible. So you know they, you know if the client wants a huge corporate campus in a forest, he'll pick the site where he doesn't have to intrude upon nature as much as possible. Um, so I think in that way he really, you know, respected his environment and tried to collaborate with nature as much as possible. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure he was ever, you know, I suppose, you know, using that as his main architectural driving force. I think it's more important to him now, obviously, because of the world we live in now, but 60s, 70s and 80s, I think it was an important factor, but maybe not the, because I mean, he used concrete so much, I mean, as you can see, which is not maybe the most energy efficient material. I, I think Mark is right. I, he was never a green warrior. Um, it, you wouldn't describe him in that way, but he was always, um, always uh, somebody who was thinking of the future, who was thinking decades ahead of his time, um, in, in big picture thinking, uh, not in architectural style, but in what sort of a world are we going to live in. Um, that. That struck me very forcibly in 1983 when he came here for 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 the exhibition that was in Dublin, and uh, at that moment it was um, it was Union Carbide that was the the latest uh, evolution of the corporate office space. What had happened was in the 60s and 70s, all the corporations were in Midtown Manhattan. Most of the employees were living in upstate New York or in Connecticut and were having to commute in every day, and it was becoming crazy. And so Kevin was the first person to come up with the idea that actually you could eliminate the commute. You could save the corporations from paying city taxes in Manhattan, which they were doing. And you could relocate the corporations to upstate New York, to Connecticut, to Danbury and places like that by buying wilderness sites of 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 acres, building an office and then sterilizing the rest, uh, which is what they did at Union Carbide. So it was complete rethinking of how a corporate headquarters would be in terms of its connection with its employees, um, the, the daily commute of you know, 10,000 people um, by, by train or by car or whatever. That was radical and I said, this is really amazing. I said, where, where, do, you think, where do you think the next move is happening? And in 1983, he said to me, well, actually, all we will be building are, are social spaces. We won't have offices. Everybody will be working remotely from home. Now, that's 20 years before the internet. And he's already imagining the next leap forward is actually that what we will need are social collective blue spaces to keep a corporate spirit alive, but actually people won't be coming to a place to work. They'll be working remotely. 
So he's always been thinking in a bigger picture about the world rather than necessarily being a green warrior and things like that. I think we've probably over, oh, there is, sorry, okay. we've got another I'll one. Try to be quick. Go for it. Um, and thank you. I, the same question about energy occurred to me, but another question also, uh, and thank you, very, very thought-provoking and visually uh, striking film and interesting. Um, but one of the things that struck me was about women in the film, um, that there are relatively very few contributions from women uh, in the film, and I wonder how, what, how much you thought about that and what you thought about it, and what's the reflection of the period, the main periods you are covering. Um, obviously, I would have liked to see more of Jane Roach, um, clearly a very interesting woman, and also the personal and social element that any, anybody who is as obsessed with their work, who works seven days a week to 10 o'clock at night, usually can only do that with somebody else's support, who in the case of somebody like him was probably his wife or maybe other other domestic help, um, or, or actual domestic help. Um, so I just wondered, you know, I, was, I, I just felt that was a bit of a gap um, for me. Yeah, well, it's a documentary, so we're just presenting actually uh, what was put in front of us. So with the amount of women I think that were that would have you know hired or dealt with Kevin in 60s, 70s, 80s corporate boardrooms, as like one of the guys says, there were very few. So I imagine that's got slightly better now. But we were looking at 60s, 70s, 80s corporate America, a lot of old white guys. So we weren't you know just couldn't like start you know putting in I guess interviews with women who were not there. Um, so all the, the women who were like Jane, who we'd love to have had more with, just did not want to be interviewed. So. Someone doesn't want to be interviewed, it's kind of tough, yeah. But we got her in there and I think she's really great. Um, and Ellen, you know, Ellen Rowley, Dr. Ellen Rowley, she's not there because she's a woman, she's just there because she's, you know, one of our great architectural historians. Um, and Laura, Laurie Fogarty, who's the director of the Oakland Museum, you know, she's there just because she's the director of the Oakland Museum, you know, now, I guess, you know, so it was like, well, you want to talk to whoever's there now. Um, so I think it's, it's more an indictment of, <laughs> of the people who were hiring Kevin in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, um, we didn't really have a choice in that department. Um, but I think if we were, look, if we were you know, making it, if we were looking at the people who hired Kevin you know, in the last 10 years, it'd be, a little, it'd be a little bit different, I think. I think there would be more women in management positions. Um, and the other part of your question, I've kind of, I've kind of forgotten if it was. The, the, so, the personal and social. Oh yeah, the personal and social, yeah, yes. The man yeah. who works seven days a week. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was it's kind of interesting because you know he had to cancel his wedding, of course, because um, it clashed with Euro Saren and died, and he just did not have time to get married, so I had to like postpone his wedding. Um, and for then a year. For a year, and then eventually when he got married, you know he didn't invite anyone. I think a janitor at the church was the only other witness, you know, because he literally wanted to get back to the office. So like he is kind of an insane person, you know. It is the ultimate workaholic, and. Obviously, his wife Jane enabled that. You know, like she believed so much in his talent, so much in um, in what he was doing. Because of course, she, you know, he hired her. You know, this is the <laughs> he hired her because he, you know, probably fell in love with her at the interview. But she was a great designer in her own right, um, and they were a real team, I think, actually. But of course, it's the, you know the, we're making a movie about Kevin Roach, and she did not, I think, want to feel like she was stealing his thunder. Maybe so. Maybe that was part of why she felt like she did not want to contribute. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd add to that. I mean, Jane, she, she followed all the buildings. She would have no opinion about what people that did subsequently to them. I had several conversations, and you know, this is, and, and yeah, Stuart, Stuart sort of talks about him going home, having ideas at night, and then coming back with something different. And you often wondered, you now was he having conversations with Jane? But we never, yeah, we never really, we never probably never know. I, I don't know, maybe maybe this is uncomfortable or awkward. We'll come to you one minute to see your hand there. We're, so we're, we're finished, don't we? Saying, unfortunately. Okay, yeah. Wrap it there now. Um, can you all please uh, join with me in wishing uh, this wonderful film well um, uh, in America and across the world um, and to please thank John and Mark. Thank you all for coming.